I'm Connor Old, and welcome to Connor the Contrarian, a weekly podcast where I talk about movies that either the critics or the audiences didn't like that I think are actually great movies. And today, I'm going to be covering a great family comedy that Sofia Coppola calls one of the greatest movies of the 21st century, Daddy's Home. Now, before we jump into the movie, I always like to talk about the cultural landscape of the film at the time of release. This helps us understand the mind frame of society, which greatly influences those initial reviews. And Daddy's Home was an anticipated movie, surprisingly enough, despite it being a comedy. Normally, comedies just come out and can become surprise hits overnight. Think Game Night this year, or Jumanji 2 Welcome to the Jungle, Welcome to the Jungle last year. But this was the return of Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell together. And the last time they made a movie was The Other Guys. And that was a, a big box office hit and critically well acclaimed and a movie I personally like. And then Mark Wahlberg was also known for his comedic chops because of because of The Other Guys, but also because of movies like Ted and its sequel. Um, I liken it similarly, but not exactly, uh, when John C. Riley and Will Ferrell will team up later this year um, for Holmes and Watson. It's an anticipated team up of a comedy duo we like. So, when the reviews came out, I wasn't surprised as they were poor, and a lot of comedies have poor reviews, it's just sort of the nature of comedies and and, and critics, but I'm not going to do a comedy, say, like Step Brothers on Connor the Contrarian, because despite it having poor initial reviews, I think there's a a big enough cult status around Step Brothers, and most people agree that, you know what, it's dumb, but it's silly and it's fun. However, with Daddy's Home, I don't think there really is a fan base, Uh, just a lot of people who saw it, you know, maybe liked it and that's it, but at least in the critical community there hasn't been any sort of cult status, and to be fair there hasn't been enough years, but even with the sequel coming out, um, there wasn't a lot of people that said, you know, hey I actually really like Daddy's Home and sort of uh, propelled it into it, despite me actually checking it out one time and actually really enjoying it, Um, and actually they, they liked People, I guess people that showed up, they liked it enough to allow it to gross $242 million at the box office and create demand for a sequel, which made uh, quite a bit less and only made $180 million. Um, it's always hard to judge whether or not people did show up to the second because they didn't like the first or not. Um, but we're not talking about a sequel. Um, we're talking about the car- comedic cartoon come to life with just the right touch of familial sentiment. That is the underrated 2015 comedy, Daddy's Home. So let's jump into the movie. We open with a question posed by a man's voice over top home video footage. What do kids need more, a father or a dad? We hear this man tell tell us that he thinks everyone can be a father, but not everyone can be a dad, and that he always wanted to be a dad, and now as we see him and we cut away from the black, we see Brad Whitaker, played by Will Ferrell. But as much as he loves being a dad, his kids hate him. Well, they're not actually his kids. He's their stepdad. And as we see his, his interaction with them, we get to understand the relationship um, through this very first scene as we see his stepdaughter, Megan, played by Scarlett Estevez, shows him a picture she drew of the family. Um, and it's all nice, except Brad has a knife in his head and homeless man poop on his head. Uh, <laughs> then his wife, Sarah, played by Linda Cardellini, walks in and is embarrassed by the picture. But Brad's not. Brad's not that type kind of guy. He sees the better in things and points out that this is po- progress because... It's the first picture where he isn't already dead. This transitions into the opening credits as we see the opening credits and all the different titles um, with a backdrop of a hilarious multitude of other pictures Megan drew that show Brad dying in uh, different ways uh, in different holidays with Easter and Christmas. Um, This is not the first time this has happened. Uh, However, in the next scene, Brad may be making some progress as his stepson Dylan asks for his advice for bullies he's dealing with. Then in the next scene, Megan goes up to him and asks him to go to the daddy daughter dance with her, in which he then, as she puts it, cries like a little bitch. Um, And just as they are finally becoming a family, their biological father calls and says he's coming over tomorrow. And before we meet him, I want to mention a little bit about all the little things Will Ferrell does or things he emphasizes to make us understand who Brad is. Before um, the biological father gets into the picture, there's a lot of great things that Brad and Will Ferrell does to make us, make us understand Brad. That's all in Will Ferrell's performance. Um, things like how he reads step-by-step dad books or refers to their biological dad as a, as a rascal. <laughs> it's these throwaway lines that help us build Brad as a character. You feel like Will Ferrell knows this guy and nails all of his little quirks so well that it makes everything he does, says, or how he reacts to a situation feel genuine and therefore absolutely hilarious. And this translates into the next scene where where we see where Brad works. 
and he works at a smooth jazz radio station. Uh, we meet his boss, his boss, played by Thomas Hayden Church, who tells him a story about how he met his wife and eventually, and you know, eventually loved her, and then it, it's over. And it's kind of a comedic speech. Um, he, we see this reoccurring, um, and then Brad points out its sort of utter insignificance to him, him himself, and they start to sort of poke fun of these motivational stories and movies, how everyone has this great story that has to relate to your life. But this one was just a funny story just for the sake of it and to nail that punchline of just making fun of these comedic sort of these motivational speeches in movies. And, and it's a great comedic moment because you expect one thing because of human nature and even our own sort of movie language that most people have in them. And then you subvert it at the perfect time and, you know, really be able to land that joke. So now we see him picking up the biological dad at the airport with one of those taxi driver signs with the person's name on it. And there's a great character introduction as we see Dusty Mayron, played by Mark Wahlberg, in a leather jacket and thunderstruck by ACDC is being played as he comes down the escalator. Then, as Brad goes to introduce him, Dusty walks right past him. Uh, now, Brad is driving home, and who does he see at his house but Dusty? And he's one a hot habanero pepper because they are being fed got this star bus, starburst and brad even raises his voice uh, so brad goes in to confront dusty but it's not what he seems he's actually a really nice guy he apologizes sorry about that he just says he's, he's nervous about me uh, seeing his kids again so it's kind of understandable but then we see dusty tucking his kids for bedtime and we see the start of a, this running gag of the story of the evil step king and the king that bears an eerily similar presence to what's going on in their life and here we start to see the a little bit of the competition of who's the better dad Bra brad gives them eskimo kisses then uh, dusty tickles them then brad gives them a back scratches then dusty gives them 20 bucks which is always the ultimate sort of top of, of just you know here's my inf affection in uh in money form um then um as they're having a cold one as brad calls it uh brad uh, according to his wife gets tricked and allows dusty to stay with them for a week the next morning we really understand the competition and see that maybe Dusty isn't the guy we think he's not. He's clearly, he's not, you know, this nice because he wakes up early in the morning. He makes Cinnabons and even gets them a brand new dog. Um, and nobody's this nice. He's clearly trying to win his kids back and feels maybe a little intimidated by Brad. But Brad also feels intimidated by him and thinks maybe starts, we start to see that maybe this is a mistake. Um, we then see Brad try to move Dusty's motorcycle out of the way, trying to show his manhood. But... We see through right uh, that facade right away as he gets on the motorcycle and he goes almost as if from a Looney Tunes cartoon through the door of the house and exits the roof, landing the motorcycle on his brand new Ford Flex and severely injuring himself with surprisingly no scratches on the bike. It's our first glimpse of the physical humor of the movie, and not only are there funny lines from the two leads, but there's also this asp aspect of physical humor and despite this feeling almost out of place it's so ridiculous that you go along with it brad now takes dusty to work and of course becomes friends with his boss and even becomes the voice of his radio station uh, further alienating brad and showing him up on every turn because this dusty guy is just this perfect guy yeah. but brad can't do that much about it because you know that that's part of the humor is that this guy is just so ultra everyone's best friend and ultra manly and just the perfect guy and you know sarah warned us that this guy is cool but this guy is really cool he does everything he knows everyone and just gets along with everyone then that when they come back while they're at work sarah hired a handyman to fix the damage but dusty and brad can't do it themselves can do it themselves right brad uh you know, Brad says, oh, of course, you know, I can fix it, despite him having, having no idea what uh, <laughs> what's it entails. Um, so now Brad must fire the handyman, Griff, played by Hamble Barres. He can't do it the first time, and as he does it successfully the second time, um, he's subsequently called a racist because he saw Griff was black and fired him as such. Um, Brad is losing the kids and really at this point needs to up the ante. But then in the next montage, we see what Bra what Brad's good at being involved and emotionally available. But that doesn't last long because Dusty has built a tree house and a half pipe in their backyard. Once again, Brad tries to show it to Dusty by dusting off his old skateboard and giving it a shot on the half pipe. And then once again, the absurd physical humor rears its head as Brad goes on one side of the half pipe and right into an electrical line, shocking him and landing him flat on his back from 20 feet in the air. And Dusty uses this as a learning experience, cutting all the seriousness out of the scene. And it's something that rarely works in comedies. Um, 
you know, I'm over for, for, for me, it was very surprising because it never really worked for me, the idea of sort of immediately cutting the seriousness. You know, I'm always, at least in the back of my head, concerned about the real world effects. Like, how is, you know, Brad is possibly dead. Um, but in this one, I'm laughing too hard at Dusty's whole don't panic bit that I don't care. And Wahlberg really sells the scene, just trying to do everything possible to make him look better than Brad and using this to his kids as a teaching moment as to what to do when something's going wrong. Well, um, the wife, his wife, Sarah, is just completely freaking out. Um, and, and people don't give Mark Wahlberg enough credit for his comedic stuff. He can do the lone survivor serious stuff, but he also nails the comedy and has comedic comedic timing which is something that doesn't really come to a lot of people and it doesn't come to all actors so he does a great job here and i think you know that it's under that he's underrated overall and he's only known for ted and the other guys but this is a generally uh, committed comedic performance whether or not people choose to recognize it the next scene we see that dylan is still getting bullied and brad's trust fall technique that he told him to do didn't work dusty wants him to wants him to beat the bullies up and there's a funny bit funny bit about Brad's suggestion being dance battle solving problems. Um, ultimately, though, beating them up is the best option. And as they're role playing, Brad makes an inspirational speech about how he was bullied, and by standing up to his bullies, they stopped. And as the music swells, we look like we're about to transition into the next scene. We cut back to Brad mentioning that, well, actually, his story wasn't all that true. Uh, that he did get bullied and actually didn't stand up to them and had to change his name to Dave Lacecock and pretended he was blind. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere, and it's a classic Will Ferrell absurdism, and is maybe, in my opinion, the funniest joke in the entire movie because it really comes out of nowhere. But in the next scene, Dusty convinces Brad and Sarah to go see his friend, who is one of the top five reproductive endocrinologists in the country. Now we have another brilliant scene from Brad's legendary boss about how his fourth wife had a Brazilian son who he adopted and once became a citizen revealed that, oh, it's actually the wife's boyfriend. Um, just these crazy interjected stories, stories that don't serve any purpose but work really well because the boss is such a funny character. But the scene is even funnier because... Uh, because the the funnier than the last story because they employ a, a really unique camera trick here that I did catch the first time but I caught through multiple viewings um where the entire conversation is played in a shot reverse shot looking as if they are alone in a room together sharing this intimate story and then as the scene ends it ends with a wide revealing that they're actually in a meeting and there's other people listening in on this story it's a clever visual gag that allows this funny movie to become even funnier and work on a whole different level it's it's a clever thing and that there are, there's all these little clever things going on throughout the movie so this was a really you know another a great example of it but now we meet the doctor, uh, played by Bobby Cannaval, uh, to get tested for reproductivity, and and because Brad couldn't have kids before, um, and thankfully, because he's a great doctor, the results came out positive, totally going against what Dusty meant him to do. Um, it's been a hectic, you know, back and forth of win lose between Brad and Dusty, and it's about to get a whole lot crazier. Now it goes over the top. Uh, the next scene sees Brad give Christmas in April and has presents, oh, all from Brad, including a pony and tickets to the Lakers game. But it's not long before Dusty wins again because when they go to the Lakers game, Dusty gets the family courtside tickets and gets even to meet Kobe Bryant. Now Brad's had it. He freaks out because Megan has now asked Dusty to go to to go with her to the daddy daughter dance, and you know this is the last straw for Dad. Uh, for for Brad, he gets absolutely plastered at the game, and during halftime, goes to the court and professes his love for Sarah and hatred for Dusty. And during the half court shot, pegs one of the cheerleaders in the face with the basketball. Um, this back and forth is completely out of control. It, it's a reverse of what they want. You know, they want to be good dads and role models for their kids, but by doing this stupid petty competition, they prove how childish they actually are. And this time, the immaturity has gone too far, and Brad gets kicked out of the house. Now we have to see if Dusty can do what Brad does, be the responsible dad instead of just the fun dad. But soon we realize he can't stay inside the cones. And four days later, we cut back to Brad, and he's been living in his office. And But he learns quickly that Dusty isn't dealing with all the new dad stuff, and Megan now has no one to take her to the daddy-daughter dance because Dusty bails. So Brad goes, he finds Dusty at the airport, and convinces him to go to the dance because they both see, now they just really both see each other's sides and motivations, and they're humbled. When they arrive at the dance, we finally see Dylan's bullies. And who are they? 
but fourth grade girls. Uh, right before Brad and Dusty are about to stop Dylan, he punches one girl in the face and in the swimsuit area. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, you know, we all think these are just these bullies and you have to beat them up, but then we don't realize that they're actually girls and we never did. And it's kind of a, a funny comedic uh, punchline there. Um, naturally, the dad of the girls is mad, but this time they decide to solve it Brad's way as the movie ends with a dance battle. And only great movies, as we know, end with dance battles. And that's a fact. Now we're in the epilogue, and we learn that Dusty has moved across the street and even has his own stepdaughter. They really got the co-dad thing on lock. But the movie ends with learning about Dusty's new stepdaughter's real dad, John Cena. So it sequel baits us a bit, but the sequel really doesn't go there. So, you know, even if you see the first one, it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of a neat sort of fun cameo at the end. Um, John Cena is in the second one more than this one but it doesn't really have to do that's not the storyline that maybe they thought they were going um, and I've now that we're in the movie I've really had a challenge talking about it's funny because and doing comedies whether it be on my YouTube channel series um, or with this and I'm going to continue to sort of work on this and sort of keep on doing this but it's hard to talk about comedies because it's hard to explain what's funny. You know, I try to justify the little things the characters do or the funny lines, but humor is subjective, and I know that. And for me, this one really works. So I just really want to do this episode to get it out, the word out there that I think Daddy's Home is actually a pretty funny movie, and you may want to check it out for just a good, familiar, sort of family-based, uh, a little bit of uh, physical humor and, and funny uh, gags in a movie, which is kind of hard to find these days. Uh, I, I really just, the, why it works for me, I think, is I love the blend of the small minutia actions of Brad and Dusty that make them feel real feel real and really realized. I, mean, I also love the absurd, and I mean absurd, visual gags that toe the line uh, of being funny without realizing the seriousness of it all, added on the end to a genuine heartfelt moment. And the ending really made me realize how much of a family film it actually is. It has few curse words, physical humor, and a great message. And the message doesn't seem forced, that it's been there the entire time, that these adults are really acting like children, and that being someone's stepdad or having a new dad raise their children is a tough thing to do for both parties. But it doesn't need to result in violence, and I really found it to be genuine. It came out of nowhere because we've been so focused on the hilarity of the rivalry, but when you look back on it, the entire movie is, is about family, so it's most definitely a family movie. Plus it looks at the insane childlike competition even adults must learn. I think the movie was also like many of the uh, Connor the Contrarian movies, a victim of circumstance. People know Will Ferrell and even Mark Wahlberg do these R-rated comedies, and they thought maybe it'd be more of that. But it's not. It's a comedic family film. This is a trend we see with actors that become parents who want to make movies for their kids, and this is a, a result of that, but that's most of them are bad, and this one actually is pretty good. And in a political atmosphere that is so toxic, where there's one team versus another, we need these kinds of movies to, that use the situation to over-dramatize it to the point of humor, to show the ridiculousness of grudges and petty fights. You know, it's a movie that nobody liked, but it's the movie we need. Daddy's Home, check it out, because Daddy's Home is a great movie. I'm Connor Roll. Make sure you rate and review the podcast on iTunes. It really helps. I also have a YouTube channel. Just search Connor Roll, and you'll find other film-related content, including a series that I'm doing right now called Old on Old, where I look at a classic movie I've never seen before and talk about why it's a classic. That's about it. I hope you enjoy the episode, and until next time, stay tuned.